You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through this grace, we become partakers of God's righteousness and are made heirs of eternal life and are initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Remember the words of Jesus and how he said, Do not hinder the little children, but let them come unto me. Today, Luke and Dane Stocker bring their child to be baptized. So before we have this baptism, let me ask you these questions. Do you, in presenting your daughter for baptism, profess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And will you accept as your duty and privilege the task of living before her a life that reveals the gospel? And will you nurture her in Christ's holy church so that by your example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith in Christ, and to lead a Christian life. Since ancient times, the historic Apostles' Creed has been a baptismal creed. Therefore, let us stand and along with this family affirm our faith using these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Eternal God, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and grant that Laurel, as she grows in years, may also grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and serve you all of her days. Amen. Well, I tell you what, Mama, I'm going to let you hold her. It's, it's okay. Laura, let's walk over here. Do you, Laura, do you like water? You want to touch water? You want to touch the water? Nope. <laughs> it's okay. Well, Laurel, I'm going to let Mama hold you while we do this. <laughs> I, I want you all to remember that, that baptism signifies what God is doing. And whether we come rejoicing or, or celebrating in a different way, <laughs> it is still God at work. So, Lord, we're going to try this one more time. And I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father uh -huh, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, can I hold you? Nope. Okay. Well. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. Laurel, look at all these people out here. Take, I want you all to look at this absolutely beautiful young girl. Even though she's not real happy with me. 
and let's see, Luke, I want you to move so the choir gets to see her. Do you see them waving at you? Now, in just a moment, you are going to be making a pledge. Laurel, Laurel probably won't be here very often. But you know what? When she's here, when she's here, she's going to be in our Sunday school class. She's going to be in worship. She's going to see you all around the halls. And you are going to be one of the ways in which she comes to understand what it means to follow Jesus. So we ask you to, uh, to make a pledge to her. I commend to your care and to your love, Laurel, whom we recognize as a member of the family of God. I want to ask you this question. Will you endeavor so to live that she may grow in the knowledge and the love of God the Father through our Savior Jesus Christ? If so, will you respond with the congregational pledge? Now, Laurel will not always remember this day, except for that guy that, you know, with the beard that upset her so much. But I hope that, that each year on this day, that you will take this candle. And that you will light it. And you will tell Laurel about the day that she was baptized into Christ. And what it means to be a daughter of God. So, Laurel, this candle is for you. Now, would one of you all like to blow that out for me real quick? There we go. I'm going to let you hold that because it's hot. And I'm going to let you hold the box for your sister. And over here, we have this certificate. Let us sing. children will come forward. We'll have our children's message with Miss Brandy. today good I don't usually sit in the middle so it's kind of weird to look around at all of you <laughs> um, okay so I have a question if someone has an emergency do you know who we might call for help that's right 911 what if someone here just has a booby or something would you guys respond to them and help them out mom. you would go to your mom yeah or your dad or maybe to one of your friends or your teacher or yeah you or go to Cahill because he can help. Okay. He's, or your teacher, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So if we need help with something, we can find someone to help us, right? And if you ask somebody to help you with something, are they going to be like, no way, I'm not helping you? Now, people don't usually do that, do they? Usually people are very helpful, and they'll answer that call to help, and they'll do what they can to make things better, right? 
I mean, maybe some people are, you know, won't, but most people will generally do that. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you a story, okay? Well, sort of. Once Jesus was walking along beside the Sea of Galilee, and he was preaching the good news of God, and he made a call for help, okay? So he saw Peter and Andrew, and they were throwing their nets out into the water. What do you think they were doing? They were catching fish, right? Yeah. And so Jesus, he called to them, and he said, he said, come and follow me. Now, do you think that they were like, what? No way. I'm not following Jesus. You think they did that? No, they felt, I guess in their hearts, they felt something, and they thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. And Jesus told them that he was going to teach them how to catch men instead of fish, okay? So later, thank you. So later, Jesus and Peter and Andrew went a little further, and they found two other people, James and John. And he said, come and follow me. They were in their boat. So what do you think they did? They came and followed. Yeah, he didn't say, come follow me. And they're like, no way, we're not going to follow you. They didn't say that, right? It's kind of the same thing. as like when we need help, you know, and, and someone will help us, right? Well, Jesus asked them, come follow me. Come help me. Share God with people. And they were like, yeah, we're definitely going to do that. Well, these were adults, right, that Jesus asked. And you guys are kids. Do you think that Jesus would ask you to come follow him? Yeah, he would, right? Yeah, some people think that Jesus is only going to ask adults to help him out. He's only going to tell adults to, to do this or do that and to tell people about God. But he actually asks kids to do that too. But we may not hear him say, come follow me. Or we may not hear God call our name like he did with Samuel in the Bible. We may not hear that. Instead, we may just hear, feel something in our hearts like, huh, maybe I should do this. And if it's going to honor God then you can know that that is God calling you to do that. And we can, go, we can follow God, and we can answer the call to live a life that God wants us to live. Okay? All right, let's have a prayer. God, thank you so much for, for calling us to service to you. Help us to hear when you call us, because maybe it won't be very loud or obvious. It may be very, very quiet. And we pray that you would help us to hear that call, and you would help us to answer that call. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Before our time of prayer this morning we want to remember these concerns and celebrations we celebrate with Sam and Sophia Taylor on the birth of their daughter uh, Romilly Emerson Taylor on June 20th we also want to remember Paul Harper and Wayne Hammonds who are both have been hospitalized we want to remember the team that is down in Costa Rica for this week leading sports camp and we want to remember the family of Helen Langstaff uh, following her death this week. Catherine Buckles, whose um, uh, celebration of life will be uh, this afternoon at 3.30. We remember her family. We pray for Barbara Harkle Road and the death of her sister. And I learned this morning that uh, Billy Chesney passed away today. We want to remember her family in our prayers as well. I invite you, if you would like to do so now, to join me at the altar as we join together in morning prayer. Gracious and loving God, as we gather in this place today, we give thanks for all of your gifts, for the beauty of your creation, for those special moments in the life of our families and our church when children are baptized and, and faith is professed. 
We give thanks for the music that fills our hearts this day. Most of all, O oh Lord, we give thanks for your great love in Christ Jesus. Hear our prayers. For we know that we are not worthy of the kind of love you have bestowed. And yet in spite of our failings, our stumblings, our selfishness, our hard-headedness, in spite of it all, you, O oh God, choose to love with a relentless and unending love. And we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you care enough about us that you are aware of every hurt and struggle that we encounter. And that you have invited us to put all of our burdens upon you. And so, Lord, today we lift up our prayers for all of those who are struggling this morning, but especially for those members of our church family who are going through the hours and the seasons of grief. Be their comfort, be their strength. We hear our prayers for those who are in hospitals receiving treatments. Be their healing, their great physician, their healing presence. We pray for the team in Costa Rica. Equip them to be a faithful witness in all that they do. We pray for your church that we might be a people of vision, a people of passion and compassion, a people concerned about the needs of those around us, a people who have a heart for Jesus and an eye cast upon the world, that we would know the world is our parish, and that we would be tireless in our efforts until every, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. So, Father, today, bring your fresh wind of the Spirit upon the church that we might rise up with, with vision, with power, making a difference in your name. Hear the prayers we offer to you in silence. For all of these we offer, remembering how Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Whether it's children's ministry, ministry with our, with our teenagers, ministry with senior adults, whatever it is, it is possible only because of your generosity. At this time, as the ushers come forward, may we, we be gracious, generous givers back unto God.
we give you thanks, O oh God, for every gift. And as we return this portion back to you along with them, we offer to you ourselves. May all these gifts be used to proclaim and extend your great love through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. A couple of months ago, I got an email one morning from Brian Cornell. I hadn't thought of Brian in a long time, probably since I left here, except on a few occasions when I would run into his mom and dad. But uh, Brian, I, I knew, was headed to uh, a new appointment along with his wife, uh, Catherine. And, and in the email, Brian wondered if it would be possible that uh, one of the items on his bucket list for, was for he and Catherine to be able to preach in this sanctuary that was such a formative part of his life. And, and I couldn't wait uh, to answer back and say, I believe we can do this. And he was very nice. If you don't feel like you can work it in, don't worry. You know. And I, I thought, I remember 20 years ago, 22 years ago, when he was feeling the call to ministry and going off to seminary. And, and I just wanted to see what it had become of him, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, it's been a joy to communicate back and forth. I said, we're doing this sermon series, and it's the, that week's going to be the Macedonian call. What do you think? And, and uh, I'm going to tell you, you're about to be blessed. But Brian and Catherine are United Methodist elders. They've been serving in the Western North Carolina Conference. They're on their way to Minnesota, to Duluth. We're go they're going to begin new ministries there. And so... They're, Brian's the son of Jim and, and Lee Cornell. You all, most of you all know them, but uh, they're back home. So let's welcome them this morning. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Randy Fry. <laughs> I never knew him as Reverend Doctor. You all know him as that, and you still don't say that, right? You call him Randy or Pastor Randy, right? Um, and it, I want to give him the full list of his title because it's a real honor to be invited to be in this place, not just because of Randy's presence and the way that he carries a torch for Christ, but for all those who've gone before him and have brought that gravitas as well as their sense of unlocking the Scripture for us. To this place. So thank you, Randy, for this privilege. And I speak for Catherine and myself that this really is a delight. Um, I could spend most of the sermon just going around naming faces that are part of Christ's walk for me in here. Um, but just know that all of you are part of that blessing. Would you join with me in the prayer for illumination that is marked in the bulletin as we read together? Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, 
having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds for this morning's message as we sing just one verse of hymn number 648, God, the Spirit, Guide, and Guardian. I invite you to stand as able. You invite us to be passionate in our journey together while we answer your call. Help us to be open to your surprises, be willing to journey, and join in the places where you are already at work. Amen. We want to express again how grateful we are to have this privilege um, to get ready for preaching here, we went online and watched the services uh, that you all had. And so I started picking out your heads and faces last week because what you all get to sit and see the whole community, right? But when you're online, it's the choir that we get to see the whole time. And so there was my piano teacher from my childhood. And there's my next door neighbor who knows where all the bodies are buried and I hope she doesn't say anything. But... Um, it was a real blessing to, to see you all and know that we'd be joining you, but also it's a little bit nerve-wracking because, as Randy pointed out in that sermon last week and during this service, when you have returned to a place where you've been gone for some time, there's a chance to run into things that might make you feel a little older. <laughs> like seeing J.D.'s son as an acolyte on the front pew. You know, that's where we got started wearing these weird things, and look what it did to us now. 
So thank you, Randy, for having us for this privilege and opportunity. It is a great joy to be with you this day on the second Sunday after Pentecost to join with you in talking about what it means to answer the call as a passionate church. Both Brian and I have had some experience in answering calls, and I know you probably have too because we all know that ministry is not just for those of us that wear these funny-looking robes, but also for everyone. God calls each of us to ministry for God's good purposes. So Brian and I answered the call some 20-odd years ago, and we are both ordained elders in the United Methodist Church, but we're also passionate as well. Sometimes that gets us in trouble with our kids. Oh dear. <laughs> as we walk through the school holding hands, the kids go, oh, mom and dad. But one of the benefits that we've found in pastoring together and in being in ministry is the privilege of encountering scripture and allowing our different points of view and our different um, where the scripture hits us to be expressed. And so we thought this morning that as we read the scriptures, that we would share with you today some different perspectives that we had on this one passage. So we're really showing you some of what we do every Sunday. Catherine and I, uh, I don't know how we minister before Google Docs was invented because we write the sermon the same time on the same page. Our churches, um, which are several at times, we tell them, um, we co-wrote this. And we've had people at times go to one church and then the other and say, well, you say that you wrote it together, but I heard two different sermons. And for those who are now sitting with us, they may say you've heard three different ones before we're all done. Hopefully we'll hit the same points. So Paul had to reach out to different communities too, right? And the message was the same all the time, but he's always adapting to find out what reaches people the best. And in this first community where Catherine read the scripture first, he's gone to a place where um, not only are they glad to receive Paul, but they're also especially proud of a young man in their midst. They say, oh, this is who you need to take under your wing. Dr. Randy Fry. If you would just work on Brian, he needs a lot of polish. And thank you, by the way, for all of that. Um, maybe then we can make something of him. In the United Methodist Church, that's going through the process of ordination. But in the early church, Paul knew that there was something that needed to happen for Timothy for him to be received. You see, he was of mixed heritage. He had a mom who was Jewish, but a dad who was oh, Greek. And so... That whole Greek thing had to be overcome. And what they did then wasn't baptism. God bless. Um, she cried. But that's the sound I feel in my heart when I hear this word. Timothy was circumcised. <laughs> it was in this church during confirmation that that word came up. And the guys in the church turned to Gail Pressler and said, What's that mean? You'll have to ask Gail how that worked out, but I will say we didn't look her straight in the eye for another week. <laughs> so Timothy has to go through this. I think that's also very interesting that Paul is the one who's saying what needs to happen in ministry, but it's the wingman who gets the knife. So be careful when you're the spiritual wingman. <laughs> so they do this to be accepted in their current area, and it works out. The ministry takes off. In the scripture we hear that more are added to them daily, that the community has grown, right? But they're not supposed to stay there, are they? They go from there to some other environments. And Paul, I don't know exactly what's going on, but maybe this scriptural easy plan that he had in front of him isn't working out because he reverts to some of the things that we as pastors go to when we're nervous. And that is interpreting dreams and visions. That's more of a, a prophet type stuff. And we who wear the robes would rather not get out always in the edge of prophet. Because it means we have to speak a word that God gave us and wait for it. So that is what is happening. Paul hears a word says, a man comes to him in a dream and says, come and help us in Macedonia. So he wakes up and to his credit, he is ready to roll. But 
the thing is, Macedonia is the home of the Greeks. Remember what he did to Timothy so that the Greekness of him would be hidden? What's he going to do now? Because Greek world is the center for rational thought, not a place for faith. This is where the scientific method was started and honed. Engineers and people of the plant, you understand what I'm talking about. It's like a different language. And so they go over there, prepared to meet the man who has said, come and help us, and they find out it's not a man at all. <laughs> it's a woman named Lydia who is ready to receive the message. The Bible even says she's a believer, but something yet needs to happen. And guess what it's not going to be? It's not going to be circumcision. <laughs> So Paul has had his expectations flip completely upside down. What he thought he was going to do is still true. He's going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the method he's going to use has gone completely the other direction. But he adapts and he changes. And because he does, one of the pillars of the early church is grown, not in a man, in a woman. And it changes everything. It changes everything. So we're left to ask ourselves, when have our plans for ministry changed? When have our expectations been turned upside down? Brian, when have your expectations for ministry been turned upside down? And here's the next question. If they haven't, why not? So while God's surprises stood out to Brian, what stood out to me in the passage is that following Jesus, being a disciple, is a journey, not a destination. Did you notice in our scripture, 15 verses, how many different places were mentioned? I counted eight different places that were named that Paul and Timothy and the, his companions went to. That doesn't count the places that they tried to go to and were turned away from. It also doesn't count the town to towns that were mentioned. Eight different places that I could hardly pronounce. I don't know if y'all noticed that either. <laughs> so this following Jesus is a journey. Yes, we know that as we, um, when we accept Christ, we, we receive life eternal in, in that place, and, and we love the, the images of heaven, but it's a journey. It's not the destination. Now, I know a little bit about journeying these days. I've been Moving from North Carolina to Minnesota, we've been packing for three months. Have you tried cooking without a kitchen? <laughs> yeah, he's the one that does it. Thank goodness. I also have been on a journey. I um, traveled on my bicycle from Hickory, North Carolina to Lake Junaluska on a three-day, 140-mile bike ride to raise money for the Wesley Foundation just last week. So I know a little bit about journeys. And one thing that is in common to all journeys I've taken is that at some point in time, they're uncomfortable. There is no comfort on putting your backside on a bicycle for five hours a day. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to have all your belongings stowed in different places, two places in Minnesota and also Lee Cornell's garage. That's where my stuff is. It's uncomfortable. But then again, when we said yes to Jesus, God didn't promise comfort. In fact, God kind of promised exactly the opposite. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. What? That's this journey. But while God doesn't promise comfort on the journey... God does promise to be present with us. 
And God provides for us companions, people to go and travel with us. Do you notice Paul didn't travel by himself? He took Timothy and companions. They weren't by themselves. Nor do we ever travel alone. Even when I was on my bike and there was nobody in sight before me or behind me on this journey, I knew that it seemed like I was alone, but not only was God with me, but I knew that up ahead somewhere were my fellow companions. My son, who's 15, was back behind me somewhere. Behind you. Most of the time. Yeah. But there are companions that travel with us. That's what the church is, the body of Christ. You who are gathered here together to journey with one another through the tough and uncomfortable times. When I was in seminary, a professor of mine said, you know, each church should have luggage in their front area, just bags, as a reminder that we are not a church that's stationary, but we're a church on the move. That we are people who belong to a different place. We belong to the kingdom of God. And as we live in this world, we bring that kingdom. We work with God to bring that kingdom to places, little pockets of the kingdom where two or three are gathered, where love is shared, where relationships are built. There is the kingdom of God. And so, even though you might not be actually physically moving your household from one place to another, you are on a journey of some sort. And you have companions with you. I have a spiritual director who is one of my companions on a journey. And as I was speaking with her one time, I realized that I kept on coming up against the same um, blocks to my spiritual development that I felt like I, I've come up against this before and, and here it is. Why do I get stuck here all the time? And she said, wait, wait, wait. Look back. Five years, 10 years, 20 years ago, were you in the same place? I said, well, no. No, I, I can see I, I have journeyed. It's a similar place, but not always the same. And so as you go and encounter in your life, your spiritual development, your growth, where do you find and look that you have journeyed? And maybe you struggle with some of the similar things, but in a different way. That's a journey that we take. God calls us to continue to walk in that path, God invites us to continue that journey. And it will be uncomfortable sometimes. But the question becomes, what is our next step on the journey? Who can help us get there? And who are our companions on the way? So obviously we had different emphasis that struck us out of the scripture, but one that we came back to, and it's really not a surprise, but rather surprising we both found at the same time, and that is that whatever you get called into, whatever discomfort you come to, or uh, whatever unexpected turns the journey might take, you will find that God is already doing the work ahead of you, right? Um, I want to remind you, of, and I've saved this story for this group. Um, when I came back here in 1995 after graduating Wake Forest, I went to a Sunday school that I was told was built for the young adult class, or you know, young adults in particular. So I went to it, and around the corner, there was a class called The Young and the Restless. And they were so restless, nobody was in it. <laughs> the light was off, no teacher, and I was like, what's up with that? So I went and annoyed um, my parents, the friends of my parents. Um, Janet Barnes was one of those that I went and annoyed, and uh, I'm trying to think, Margie Nichols was another. And that's because they're sympathetic listeners, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, the people that are too kind to say, you should go away, you're bothering me. And that's, that's who I went to. And I started asking them about what we might do about a young adult class. And I think then we probably came to Randy, who may have bumped us upstairs to whoever. Right, so 
finally everyone said, well, it's such a great idea, you go do that. <laughs> go do something about it. And so we got together a group of people to start praying and wondering about what it might be like to have a young adult Sunday school class that was active. Someone came up with the idea of the name Lazarus class, which was very uh, good, the idea that the dead would come alive and that where there had been no life, there would be life. And we planned this thing called the Big Do, and it got really funny. I mean, with that word, you know. Um, we were going to have a Big Do, and I'm, God help us for the things we come up with as good ideas in church, right? Um, and this party would be at AFG Campground, and we were going to invite every young adult we knew in the community to come and participate. And then out of that, we'd say, now, who of you would like to keep meeting? And we called it Sunday school, and that's what would happen, right? Great idea, fabulous idea. I think we even had a motorboat ready. Um, we were going to go out in the lake, play games, have a cookout. Um, we had a BYOB, bring your own Bible. And um, it was going to be a lot of fun, except for the rain and the storm that came up and just about swallowed us whole. It just didn't happen. We got out there, did the planning. Nothing, nada, just chaos. So we got ready to come back to Sunday school the next week with the planning group that had done it. And when we sat down and kind of were grumping about our big do being a big nothing, we had a visitor that day came in and said, I'm so glad to see a young adult Sunday school class. I've been looking it all over for churches, and this is the first one I found. And we looked around and said, well, this is just the planning group. This is the group that was supposed to build the big thing. And we realized that someone else had seen what we couldn't see all along. God had already built the class that needed to be there. It wasn't our big do, it was God's do. And we just had to get with it. So that's the enduring legacy of what First Broad Street allowed God to come and do and change the way I was ready to see things. And that is to know that God is often already at work. God was already at work in Macedonia. It was just a matter of Paul and Timothy and the others to get into the work and to fall in together. So some of you, and we all know now, that Brian and I are in the process of moving from North Carolina to Minnesota. We are continuing our work and call as serving as pastors in the United Methodist Church there. And so um, when people hear that we're moving, they're wondering, who did you take off in United Methodism to get sent to Siberia? Um, and that's a good question, actually. But the fact is, um, that's not how it happened, nor do we have family connections. As you know, my family is here. I've got people with my name on it in the columbarium. Um, Catherine's family is in Atlanta, Georgia, and they're, um, they are members of Peachtree Christian Church there. So that's not why we're going there either. And so when people say, why Minnesota? I said, well, ha. Huh. That's a story. It goes back to God's holy surprises. Imagine my surprise when I sent Brian off to a week of study leave at Duke uh, University. Sometimes you get a, a week to go and, and study. He was going to study a discipleship program and how to build that, right? This is what he was going to go do. And he comes back and he says, well, Catherine, what do you think about doing ministry in Minnesota? Or was it Montana? Or maybe Maine? No, Michigan. where was it? No. Mississippi? It had an M. I know that. <laughs> I said, Minnahui what? Yeah. Minna where? Where's that? I said, no, I don't think so. So what happened is in my week of study leave, I'd run into a district superintendent who had mentioned to me some of the opportunities and challenges of doing ministry in Minnesota. And in our conversation together, I found that they were looking for things that I thought that Catherine and I shared in ministry. Not that either of us had by ourselves, but that we do have together. Along with some opportunities for our children that we hadn't anticipated. And so we looked into it, and we're going to Minnesota. And we've had friends and family who have helped us along the way. It's a journey but we've had help preparing meals, delivering them to us, helping pack our boxes and bags to our, for our new home in Duluth, Minnesota. And just like with Brian's big do, <laughs> Did a big do. we realize that we're going to a place that God is already at work, and we look forward to joining in in the building of relationships, the sharing of God's love, and answering the call, we can't wait to join in. So in our reading of Acts today with you, 
we hear that we have a call as a passionate church who answers the call to share the gospel in the following ways. We need to be ready for surprises. We need to be ready for a journey with the companions that are beside us. And we need to be ready to notice where God is already at work so that we can join in. In the name name of of the the Father, and and of the the Son, and and the Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 157, Jesus Shall Reign. Let's stand and sing just the first verse together. Now may the grace of God, the love that he revealed to us in Christ Jesus, and the equipping and inspiring presence of the Holy Spirit lead all of us into the life that truly is abundant and eternal. Amen.